We continue our study of a general introduction to the Bible. We're going through the journey of how the Bible came to be. Uh, the words coming from the mind of God revealed to his prophets, his servants, and from the penmanships of those who were led by the Spirit to, you know, the writing materials that were available in their time. Uh, and then throughout history, the perseverance or the the preservance of the scripture uh, throughout history. And now we are able to, we're so blessed to have a copy of the word of God here with us. And so uh, we continue in this class. Last week, we were still in the section of writing materials. Um, and the ones that we've covered so far is stone. You remember that God gave Moses two tablets of stones, which he shattered. Uh, the rough estimation of that event is somewhere around 1445 BC. And then you we talked about clay tablets. Um, and one of the major uh, archaeological finds is in the clay cylinder, uh, the Cyrus cylinder. Uh, Cyrus, the king of Persia, was prophesied by Isaiah before he was born that he would be God's servant to release God's people from captivity. And we looked at papyrus, right? One of those uh, plants that grow along the uh, marsh areas of the Nile River. And it was used by the Egyptians and those around that area to write things down. Right? They go through a process of making that uh, papyrus uh, a script. And one of the old papyrus scripts that we have today, uh, fragments of it, is the Rylands Papyrus, dates back to about AD 125. There is several others older from the Old Testament, but this one uh, contains John 18, verse 31 through 33. And then the last one we looked at last week was leather, how they took animal hide, goat skin, lamb skin, uh, cow, you know, bulls and goats, um, and how they... There's a process that they go through uh, to prepare that skin and use it as writing material. Uh, one of the most popular uh, uh, findings, again, in archaeology is that of the Dead Sea Scrolls, found, dated back to uh, 250 BC in, in its origination. And the Dead Sea Scroll contained one of the uh, complete scrolls of Isaiah, an entire complete book of Isaiah was discovered there in one of the caves, and um, it's made of leather, right, um, the leather material. Today, we continue with the writing materials, and the next one we look at is called parchment, right? And again, I'd like to read a quote from uh, Wagner's, uh, Paul D. Wagner, Dr. Paul D. Wagner's book, uh, The Journey from Text to Translation, uh, the origin of the Bible. So, and I quote, parchment is also made from the skins of animals such as sheep, calves, uh, goats, and antelope. The skins are soaked in lime water to make them white. And Bruce Metzger uh, notes, the younger the animal, the finer was the quality of skin. Vellum was the finest quality of extra thin uh, parchment sometimes obtained from animals not yet born. Interesting fact there, huh? Parchment was more expensive than papyrus, but it had several advantages. It is smooth and durable. Both sides could be written on. The light color gave clarity to the writing and parchment could be reused. But according to Galen, a famous Greek physician of the second century, it had the drawback of being shiny and thus put more strain on the eyes than did papyrus. The word parchment, pargamene in the Greek, is derived from the name Pergamum, a city of Asia Minor that became important as a center of parchment production. Use of parchment became in uh, use of, of parchment became popular, as missing a word there in the production of books. Oh, another typo over here that I skipped right over. 
The use of parchment in the production of books became widespread in the second century BC. And because of its durability, parchment became the preferred writing material for the scriptures. The early Greeks wrote on parchment or papyrus with reeds that had been dried, sharpened to a point, and then split in the middle of the point to hold a ink or, or frayed and used like a brush. Uh, interesting fact about Pergamum. What do we know about Pergamum? Does that name sound familiar? It's one of the churches in the book of Revelation was here in Pergamum. So you can probably imagine what, what type of material did they use in their, you know, to, to record their scriptures or what, what type of materials uh, made their copies of the scriptures? Very likely it was parchment. And if you remember in the scriptures, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 13, when Paul wrote this last letter uh, in his life, as most uh, believe it to be, uh, when Paul wrote, he said to Timothy, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Paul, what are you going to do with parchments? <laughs> Maybe write some letters to the churches, right? Um, and so, uh, interesting. Uh, another uh, form of uh, material that was used uh, to record the word of God. The second one is wood or wooden or ivory tablets. Again, quote from uh, Wagner, a flat wood or ivory tablet covered with a thin, smooth layer of, of plaster was sometimes used for temporary messages. A metal stylus or stiletto was used to scratch the message into the plaster which could later be scraped off and coated with a new layer. This may be the stick of wood referred to Ezekiel 37 and 15. I'd like for us to go there. Ezekiel 37. We open our Bibles there with me. I'd like to read verse 15 there to verse 22. All right. Again, you may add this text in your appreciation of the fact that, you know, God commanded his servants to write things down, to write down his words, to write down his commands. Um, Ezekiel 37, verse 15, beginning. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, as for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Eph Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, thus says the Lord God, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land, on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. Uh, again, uh, this the context is about God and what he's going to do through Cyrus. He's going to bring back his people and make them as one again in the land of Israel. You remember uh, that after Solomon died, what happened to the kingdom of Israel, the one nation of Israel? The nation was divided, right? They had the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. And so this prophecy is looking forward to the future where after captivity, right? Uh, Assyrian takes the northern kingdom, 722 BC. 
And then Babylon takes the southern kingdom. And so from 606 uh, um, to, uh, from 606, you count 70 years of captivity, right? Uh, 586, the temple was destroyed. And so that's what this context is really about. But the highlight here is the word sticks, right? Uh, the word can be misleading. When you think of a stick, and you might think of something that looks like this, right? A, like a stick, right? But the Hebrew word simply means wood or tree. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be a stick, like a long stick, right? And so uh, that's why he makes this reference that, you know, very likely wood was also part of, you know, a piece of wood that could fit in one's hand and join together, you know, in a book. That could be the reference here. I don't know for sure, but again, another interesting material uh, used to write um, the scriptures. Uh, any thoughts before we continue? Or question or comments? Yes. Mm -hmm. The books there. So the I'm trying to think what other books, uh, how those books were, or what type of materials are those books? That it is probably parchment joined together in in, in making a, a book. Um, it could be a leather a leather scroll. Um, Oh, sorry, for those online, <laughs> for, the, for those online, um, you want to ask a question. If you go back to uh, 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 13, the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, bring the cloak and bring other, other things. He says, and the books, especially the parchments. And, and you want to ask, a, curious about, you know, what were the books, or what type of materials where those books are uh, made of. And so um, books could be made of, uh, of scroll, leather scroll, papyrus reed, or even parchment. So I, I don't, I, I haven't looked into specifically the, this case of 2 Timothy 4, 13, but very likely it might be books made of parchment. And, and it could be that he's referring to the books already written and the parchments to write more books right and so uh that's an interesting one i'll look more into that uh, next week but it may, it may be a book made of uh parchments uh the uh, technical term would be the word uh coded codices codex all right any other thoughts or uh comments or questions all right, so we have uh, parchments, we have wooden and ivory tablets. The next one are potsherds, all right, or pieces of, of, of broken pot or the whole vase, if you will, also known as ostracas. Again, from Wagner, potsherds or ostraca are pieces of broken pottery. Uh, see Job 2, verse 8, Isaiah 30, verse 14. Can someone read that for us? Can one go to um, Job 2, verse 8, Isaiah 30, and, and 14? It's just a reference to the fact that pottery was around that time, and uh, they were used for various reasons. Uh, they, uh, Job used it to scrape his skin. That's the reference there. Um, uh, but... Apparently, it was also used by some to write scriptures on. Right? So secondary use of a certain pottery, right? Um, you know, sometimes uh, we do that with, you know, different uh, utensils. Uh, you know, we have secondary uses for them. Um, you know, uh, you fry the egg uh, with your frying pan, and then you also um, use it to spend. I mean, I'm kidding. <laughs> But uh, someone read those references for us. Job 2, verse 8, Isaiah 30, and verse 14, please.
I'll read Isaiah 30, verse 14. Uh, it says, and he shall break it like the breaking of potter's vessel, which is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so there shall not be found among its fragments. A sharp to, uh, a sharp to take fire from the uh, earth or to take water from the cistern. And so the, again, he's using the reference to say these things were available around this time. It's not really like a reference. And he wrote on the potter, right? Not like that. Uh, Job's, Job 2, 8. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. And pottery, pottery is one of the most accurate dating methods when it, when it's, when it comes to archaeology, they look at the types of pottery. Uh, certain archaeologists can identify the time frame just by looking at the make of this, you know, the design of the pottery and whatnot. But here in our in our uh, focus here, it's it was also used to write scripture on it, right? We're talking about writing materials. And so continuing the quote. Uh, pot shirts or ostraca are pieces of broken pottery used for jotting notes in the absence of better materials. Generally, a pen or a small reed uh, brush was used for writing, but sometimes a name or a short note would be inscribed on the surface of a pot or a vessel. A few ostraca found in Egypt bear biblical texts, possibly the possession of a poor man. Some of the most important ostraca from Israel are the Sumerian ostraca and the Lelakis Le ostraca. Um, they are the possession of a poor man. Why, why would they say that? That, that uh, you know, the, the, the poor man would write scripture on a piece of pottery. What did we just read about leather and parchment? It's expensive, right? So the, the poor wouldn't, be able to afford parchment or leather, right? And so whatever material they had to record scriptures, they'll record scripture on it, right? And it's very likely the reference here. Um, here's a picture of one of those ostracas or potsherds that were found with, uh, you know, with uh, um, scriptures written on it. Uh, this one was found in Egypt. Uh, notice with me the text there. It's uh, Luke 70, verse 71 is this one, but it was a group of, of ostracas here. But Luke 22, verse 70 to 71 says this. Then they said, are you then the son of God? And so he said to them, you rightly say that I am. And they said, what further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth right someone wrote that account on a piece of puncher right and this is the account of jesus being judged in the house of caiaphas the high priest right uh, in our trip to israel we went to a possible location of the house of caiaphas it's not far from the mount of olives uh, not far from garden of gethsemane where they took him and led him up the stairs of that house where they would judge him illegally, right? It wasn't a fair trial. But interesting, again, piece of potsherd, write the scripture on it, all right? And then there's precious metals. Different types of metals were used to write scripture. And so, again, from uh, Wagner's book, Several different types of precious metals were used as writing materials, gold, silver, copper, bronze, iron. A copper scroll around, around in the cave at uh, cave three at uh, a Qumran, sorry. Is this another typo? Man, I'm, I'm, I need to work on this. <laughs> the copper scroll. Maybe I should just bring the book and read it from the book, right? A copper scroll around... Uh, was found, I think, in cave three at Qumran, bears a list of treasure and where it was supposedly hidden. I don't know if you guys, those of you who went on that trip, I don't know if you remember the tour guide mentioning that, that there, there was a, 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 a certain time period when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered 
that all these treasure hunters start coming around the area and start looking for this said treasure, right? Um, another more significant find for the area of Bible introduction were two silver amulets found in 1985. These amulets, worn like a good luck charm, generally with religious significance, were discovered in a, in a grave about half a mile south of the old city walls of Jerusalem. Gabriel uh, Barquet, the excavator in charge of this dig, dated the amulets to the mid-7th century B.C., which would rank them the oldest biblical text found to date, and it still is. All right. So the oldest, you know, writing of scripture today is written on silver, right? And it's a it's a very small piece because it you know they wore it like they would say uh, amulets like a like a good luck charm. But if you remember, that's what it looks like. And they had to carefully unroll it so that, you know, not to damage the writing that's on this uh, piece of, of silver. Kind of like picturing a, a aluminum foil and something's written on there. It's a very thin layer and something's written on there and you got to be careful, you know, but this is silver. And uh, if you notice the writing, if you remember when we talked about the Hebrew language, uh, there were two uh, forms that, that were around, forms of, of writing. You have the Paleo-Hebrew, which is what this is, right? Or the classical Hebrew. And then to the far right of the diagram here, you have the script uh, way of writing Hebrew, right? Uh, to the right. And so uh, this piece, I believe, is in the Israel Museum. I'm trying to... I think it is in the Israel Museum, but I'll double check that for you. But it, on it, it's written the blessing, right? The priestly blessing of, of Israel, right? And on that uh, piece of silver or amulet, it says there, the Lord, you know, it, they could decipher the text and it's Numbers 20, uh, 6, 22 through 27. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his son saying, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. All right. Uh, they still do this, uh, you know, among the, among the Jews that claim to be you know, part of the tribes of Israel today, they still say this blessing when they say farewell. Well, at least some of them do, um, according to our tour guide. But when I think about amulets, right, where something like this, where scripture is written so that, you know, they wore it as a good luck charm or, or a reminder to them, uh, you can think about, you know, uh, what you might have in your house. Maybe you have a piece of wood with scripture on it, all right? Or maybe you have a, a mural of some sort or a picture with scripture on it decorating your house. And when I think about things like this, what comes to mind is Deuteronomy, right? If you go to Deuteronomy, go there with me, right? It makes sense that you can find evidence like this, pieces of things, wood, silver, gold, uh, uh, different types of material with scripture on it. Because if you see in Deuteronomy, God commanded his people to write down the word, right? In Deuteronomy chapter six, go there with me there, the part of the Shema, right? Uh, Deuteronomy chapter six, and when we'll begin reading from chapter, uh, from verse one, Deuteronomy 6, verse 1. Now, this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded you uh, commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. 
Therefore, hear, O Israel, right? And be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Now notice verse 8. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So it makes sense he would, you know, in, in the different uh, uh, archaeological digs in the Bible lands, it makes sense that you will find things like this because the Jews were commanded by God, write down the word, right? Um, on the plane back from Israel, uh, there were several Jews that sat around me, right? Uh, um, big beard, coat, you know. And I noticed at, one, at a certain uh, hour, I don't know what time it was, but I noticed I couldn't sleep. So I just, you know, observed them and what they're doing. Um, they didn't eat any, all their meals were kosher. They were specially ordered on the plane. And uh, one of them, one of them uh, took out a head covering and then he rolled up his sleeves and he brought out a small box as, as a black box and it has scripture in it, right? And the, block, and the box had a strap um, for, for, you know, wrapping it on, on, on there. And so he put the box and he strapped it on his arm. Like, like he wasn't gentle with it. Like he wasn't like slowly wrapping. He was like wrapping it like on his arm. And I was like, this is interesting. You know, and I thought about this scripture, find them on you. That's what he was doing. He was like binding this object that contains the word of God on him. And then he start praying like this, right? That's how they, that's how they pray. They, they start praying this way. And, and he did that for a long time. Uh, and so I just sat there and observed, right? Um, it's interesting to, to think about, you know, and going through these different materials that we're going through. You know, God wanted his word to be written. Right? He wanted it recorded. And so the oldest copy as it stands today, who knows? They might find one older than this one. Um, as they continue to uh, excavate. But this is the oldest copy by far, dates back to about 700 BC. Um, that's amazing. Any, any thoughts before we continue? And then finally, we have paper. <laughs> <laughs> paper right the writing material with which we are most familiar was introduced from central asia to egypt about ad 900 paper was made by dipping a screen into a mixture of cotton fibers and water the cotton mixture trapped on the screen was then turned out onto a mat pressed to expunge excess water and left to dry for one to four days. Paper, coupled with the emergence of movable print, enabled books to be written cheaply and quickly. The first printed Bible, the Gutenberg Bible, was produced in 1452 using a combination of parchment and paper. All right, so... Fun fact, right? When was the first print Bible printed? All right. Zachy, you'll remember this one, right? 1452. And uh, I have a video here uh, where you could see one of those copies of the, of the, of the Gutenberg Bible in one of those uh, museums that are around today.
I'm John McQuillan, the Associate Curator of Printed Books and Bindings here at the Morgan Library and Museum. And this is the first volume in one of our copies of the Gutenberg Bible. Johann Gutenberg was trained as a goldsmith from Mainz, Germany. He worked as a metal worker, and we think that experience trying to punch out tiny little metal tin mirrors that he came up with the idea of individual letters. What history records him doing is inventing movable type in Europe. And this is the first really major and exceptional production of Gutenberg's printing press and European typography printed in about 1454. Gutenberg's development of typographic printing in Europe revolutionized European information, learning, literacy. Gutenberg printed about 180 copies of the Bible. Only about 48 are extant today in more or less complete form. When the book came off the press, only the black letters were printed. Anything in color had to be added later by hand by whoever purchased the printed sheets. So every copy has decoration specific to the first owner. So the decoration of every copy is different. This copy, you can see a blue initial I here for the beginning of in principio, in the beginning, the first words of Genesis and some sort of marginal filigree decoration. That decoration is specific to one single monastery outside of Worms, Germany. So we know that they owned this copy of the Gutenberg Bible. When this complete copy came on the market in 1911, Morgan was adamant that he acquired it for his collection. And he and his librarian, Belle de Cross de Green, worked closely with a book dealer in England to ensure that this copy made it to the Morgan Library. We always have one of the volumes of the Gutenberg Bible on display, so the public always has visual access to one of the treasures of Morgan's collection in the library. Looking back at one of the first items of printing kind of really brings that timeline into focus and you kind of understand a history of 500 years and where we were and where we are now. All right. Interesting. God chose to communicate with us through the written word. And so here's a question for us. Like, what reasons would you give as to why you are thankful for the written word of God. Right? And we should be thankful that it's available, right? that it's written down. But what are some of the reasons that you think of? See? Absolutely, failing memory, right? Um, I mentioned uh, Garland Elkins, one of our uh, instructors at the preaching school, the late Garland Elkins. Uh, he had memorized so much scriptures. And, and so we thought as students, like, how can you do that? Spend hours and hours and hours reading it and committing it to memory. So, so for those online, Lillian mentioned one of the reasons that we are thankful for the Bible having been written down is a failing memory. How many of us write things down to remember it? <laughs> God knew that already <laughs> about us, so He wrote the word down so that so that when we forget, we're like, well, let me get my Bible. Right? Have you ever had a Bible discussion where the details are kind of cloudy, and you're like? You know what? Let, uh, let me read that again in the Bible because I don't remember for sure the details of that account, right? One of the reasons to be thankful, right? Our memories, you know, it's not always sharp. Say again. Yeah, I, it, it'd be it'd be hard to memorize the entire Bible. It would, it would be uh there's so much and even even um uh, even if you do memorize it word for word 
there's still so much to discover from the different stories and accounts that are in the Bible, right? Um, uh, we sometimes, uh, as preachers, uh, uh, on our preacher forum thing, uh, there, there's uh, sometimes a discussion, well, what are you going to preach on this Sunday? All right, and, and one of our instructors would always say, preach the Bible, you'll find something. <laughs> you'll find something, preach the Bible, you'll find something in there, all right? And so, yeah, failing memory is definitely one of the reasons. What other reasons could we think of? Uh, Lima, I have one. Go ahead. Sandra. Okay, I think uh, one of the, uh, a good reason anyway, uh, is the idea that uh, everyone can read it on their own, so to speak, and that uh, they don't have to depend on someone else uh, telling them, well, this is what God says, and uh, just listen to me concept, yeah. Uh, it's a self, it's a way of checking people too, if they say, well, you know, the Bible says this and the Bible says that, you can actually go back and quote unquote, read it on your own, you know, uh, to say, well, you know, this guy said the Bible said this, but it, you know, from what I read in the Bible, it isn't, yeah. So I think that's a big thing uh, where, uh, especially with, you know, Catholics in, uh, and in the older days, people couldn't read, yeah. So yeah. they had to depend on people telling them what to, to see or do or whatever regarding the Bible. But with the printed Bible, everybody could get their own copy and read it on their own. Okay, so I, I think that's a, one of the main one of the reasons for that Gutenberg thing too. Yeah, you can mass produce it. Absolutely. Um, if you notice the Gutenberg Bible is in Latin. And around that time when it was written, only a certain group of people can read and understand Latin. And, and so uh, one of the things that the papacy did was uh, 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 they really used their interpretations of God's word to control the people. And um, one of the things that motivated uh, William Tyndale to write the scriptures in English, the common language of that time, so that people can read it for themselves and understand it for themselves instead of depending on the priest who had an agenda uh, who doesn't necessarily communicate the word of God truthfully, but use it to control uh, people. Even in the history of the United States, I read somewhere there was a Bible called the Black Bible. And this Bible was literally used to enslave the slaves. Uh, whenever the, the slaves were misbehaving, the Bible was read to them. And it says, and they would use, you know, uh, verses like what Paul said, slaves, obey your masters, twisting it out of the scriptures, right? And so you have that. And, and uh, often the slaves were forbidden to learn how to read for themselves, to learn how, you know, to understand, uh, you know, uh, the languages and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, Acts chapter 17, verse 11, right? That's, that's, that's really the thought that Andrus brought up. Uh, the Apostle Paul had traveled. This is the second time uh, he's traveling on a mission trip. And he comes to uh, Berea. Right? After leaving Thessalonica, he preached God's word there. Some of the people believed. The other people, the wicked Jews, went to the marketplace, brought some wicked man, and caused a riot in the city. And the riot was so bad that the Apostle Paul had to be led away and so safely uh, uh, escape Thessalonica. And so he came to uh, Berea, and the Bible says that the Jews there were more noble uh, because they, when Paul came there, they very likely took out their parchments. <laughs> you know, let's see what this apostle Paul has to say. And so when Paul preached to them, they were checking with their own scriptures to see if the Apostle Paul was preaching the scriptures or not. Acts 17 and verse 11, and these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They searched it how many times? Daily, right? They searched the scriptures to ensure and it's one of the saddest reality that we deal with today as Christians, as we try to evangelize, people don't check their Bibles. 
today. You know, it's like, hey, I mean, this preacher has a million followers. He must have it right. So, you know, why check? Right. And, and so that's one of, I guess that's one of the uh, blessings and also a, a, a way that God has brought forth to protect souls from the deception of the devil. He's written his word down so, and brought it through this process, translated into English, our common language, so that no one can deceive us and say, this is the word of God, and say something completely opposite of what God said, right? And so, yeah, thankful that it is written so that we won't be misled or that we can understand it for ourselves. Um, Pat, you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> for those online, Pat asked a question, how, how do scholars deal with the evolution of the English language, right? And, and uh, yeah, you follow the English language and its history, certain words change meaning over time. Uh, but that's why it's important to have those, um, uh, the Greek and the, uh, the Hebrew uh, manuscripts that are available because the, even though the other languages may evolve, the word meanings in the original language would remain, right? And so when a word in English changes meaning, uh, you can go back to the word of God and, and in the original manuscripts that are available and, and see that, hey, they use a Greek word that means this consistently throughout scripture. Take, for example, um, uh, baptism. All right, the, the Greek word uh, baptizo and the other forms of that word uh, was transliterated. We'll talk more about that in the last part of the class. But it was transliterated instead of giving the proper English word that meets the meaning of the Greek word. They just give a transliteration of the word. So you have Greek baptizo and then you have English baptism. They sound the same. But if there was a proper translation of baptizo, it would be the word immersion, right? Or the word submerge in water. But yeah, that's how they deal with the languages evolving. How you still have the manuscripts that were discovered and the meanings of the Greek words and the Hebrew words around those time um, unchanging. And so um, it's all part of God's plan, I believe. Um, Yona? Absolutely. That's one of the key ones. The important questions that philosophers look throughout the ages for the answers. Uh, question like, where did we come from? Uh, what's our purpose? Why are we here? Where are we going? You look in history and follow philosophy. Many philosophers have their own understanding. Where did we come from? Are we really here? Or maybe we're a consciousness in a box somewhere, you know? <laughs> Remember philosophy class? Um, but the word of God is there written down to tell us where do we come from? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why are we here? It's written, right? Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Where are we going? It's written. There are two destinations, right? There's the broad way that leads to destruction. There's the narrow way that leads to eternal life. There's heaven and hell. And so reasons to be thankful that it is written so that we can know that about ourselves. There's something uh, terribly uh, wrong when uh, a, a human being grows up rejecting his origin. Right? And you can see that in the moral decline in society. Those who reject um, God, who the originator, right? They, those who reject the idea of creation, look, look at the lives that they live. Look at the type of trouble that surrounds them. Look at, look at the, the, the evil and the things that they do. Read Romans chapter 1. It tells us about that, right? Those who worship the, the creature instead of the creator. Right? There's something wrong morally with them 
and it, it's 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 going to end in just uh, you know eternal destruction. So, any other thoughts? It's like my time here. Absolutely. Uh, 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 Will <laughs> we'll mention that the word gives us concrete evidence. This is our strongest evidence, in my opinion, and a lot of people's opinion too. This is the strongest evidence for the existence of God. There is no book like the Bible. No book measures up to the Bible. You want to say, well, what's the most copied book in history? What's the, mo what's the best seller among all books continuously every year? <laughs> Bible, all right? Um, uh, what, books, what book contains predictions that turn out to be accurate and true in the areas of... Uh, history in the areas of of uh science in it. there's no book like the bible right um and so yes uh it is the strongest evidence that we have for the existence of god right and we're thankful that god decided to communicate his word to to us via the written method it is written you want to establish something and finalize a, a document, put your signature on it. You have to write it down, right? You write it down. And and now, right, if you were to make one more slide of of um, of uh, writing materials, now there's a digital language. <laughs> the scriptures are written in the digital language, uh, you know, in MP3 and uh, PDF in you know the world of of the internet. Is written. All right. You can he listen to it. You can pick what kind of voice you want to, to listen to, you know, <laughs> to read you the Bible. Uh, you can simply Google something, right? What's that scripture that, uh, let me just Google it. Scripture that talks about the details of the ark. Boom. Just like that, right? Artificial intelligence. All right. Bible is written in that language as well. So, be thankful that we have the written word, all right, that we have it available to us. There has been a long process that God used to bring about his word so that we may have it today. Let us, uh, next week when we come back, we'll talk about the writing process. And uh, uh, let's conclude with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much, Father, that it is written, that it has been translated into languages that we can read and understand. And so help us, Lord, to appreciate what you've done for us. May we grow in appreciation of the fact that you want to communicate with us, that you want a relationship with us. Help us, Lord, to understand that that by deep study of your word and applying your word in our lives, that is how we accomplish our relationship with you. So help us, Father, to grow in our knowledge of your will, of you and your son, Jesus. Help us to not be hearers of the word only, but doers also. Father, we thank you for the avenue of prayer, and we want to pray a special prayer for Amanda Grace. Um, in her pregnancy, Lord, we're thankful that she's awaiting a baby boy. We pray for a healthy delivery and a healthy baby boy and for everything to go smooth for her uh, come the due date. We pray, Father, for Mua and Eric's and those traveling with them. Uh, please provide safe travels back home and bring them back safely to us in the next time. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers, for answering our many prayers. All these things, along with our individual requests, we place before your throne. May your will be done and not ours. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.